Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled Beyond TEDx. Our moderator today is Cheryl Payton, Director of Commonweal's Biomonitoring Resource Center. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A and attendee comment session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, you may also make a comment by hovering over the menu bar and clicking the raise hand feature. Our moderators will read out questions for our, our speaker to respond to and will call on attendees to comment. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we, will post, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar now is muted with the exception of our moderators and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 60 minutes and is being recorded for a call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Cheryl. Thanks very much, Hannah, and welcome everyone to this webinar, which is a celebration of the work of the Endocrine Disruption Exchange TEDx. It's also an opportunity for all of us to express our gratitude to TEDx for all the work they've accomplished in these past few years and moving forward the work of EDCs from a variety into a variety of arenas and regulatory processes. It's an opportunity to, for us all to express our gratitude and also for us to say goodbye to TEDx. TEDx has set the standard for science review and reporting. It will be always the mothership for EDCs and will be deeply, deeply missed. With that, I'd like to move directly into our first speaker, which is Carol Kwiatkowski. Executive Director of TEDx, who's going to talk about her experience at TEDx in the past few years and where different aspects of TEDx will be going into different entities for continuation of the very good work TEDx has done. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Cheryl. Make sure my slides will advance. In October 2003, about the time Theo Colborn was preparing to give birth to TEDx, I, a complete stranger, was 50 miles away, preparing to give birth to my first child. Already a week overdue, I needed a distraction. So I drove to the local library, waddled in the door, and grabbed the first five books I saw on the display counter. One of them was Our Stolen Future. The next day, my daughter was born, and I read that book as I nestled with her on the couch every day. I was learning, or most of you know, that nursing is the best chemical detox a new mother can get. I was learning this as I emptied 38 years of accumulated toxicants into my daughter. I couldn't stop nursing, but I couldn't stop reading either. This is the power of Theo Colborn's message. Four years later, I found myself knocking on the door to her house, offering to help however I could. That is where my journey with TEDx began. I look back on that day, and I think it was one of the best decisions of my life. And I think my future self will look back on my 12 years of service to TEDx and feel tremendous pride. That is what I'm here to share with you today, the things that TEDx has accomplished in its 16 years that I am most proud of. When Theo started TEDx, I imagine she had a singular vision that the world needed to know about endocrine disruption. I imagine this because whenever I asked her about our target audience, she replied, everyone, everyone needs to know this. Databases were always TEDx's media of choice. I've listed them here along with all the other creative ways we found to share information. I won't belabor them in detail. Most are still available on our website. And the good news is that our website will remain up until September of 2022. So please continue to make use of our resources for the next three years. I do want to mention that our most well-known database, the TEDx list of potential endocrine disruptors, we built this at a time when people were still haggling over the definition of an endocrine disruptor. And in many ways, they still are. But we said, let's just get a list out there of all the chemicals that have shown some evidence of endocrine activity. The list ended up being extremely useful, especially for regulatory agencies in Europe, where they've made much more progress than they have here in the US, and you'll be hearing about that later in the webinar. I think Theo's belief in the power of knowledge is what led her to take on fracking. Before, hardly anyone had heard the term. 
It began when she met a woman who had a cracked well explode in her backyard, and she subsequently developed a rare adrenal tumor, and she had a newborn baby. Of course, Theo's endocrine disruption radar was buzzing. She soon learned that finding out what chemicals were used in fracking was nearly impossible. Later, at a meeting with Earthworks, someone from a company that handled oil and gas waste approached her with a box full of safety data sheets that identified chemicals used in fracking. It was pure gold. This led to the development of our database of fracking chemicals and their associated health effects. At that time, fracking was still fairly unknown. All that changed when the Marcellus Shale began being developed and New York City became concerned. TEDx was subcontracted to research the health effects of fracking chemicals for, for their water board. This led to the New York City ban on fracking, which caught at the attention of the, the nation. Our early work also led to key research by Susan Nagel, Chris Kosotis, and others who were inspired to study the endocrine effects of fracking chemicals. Our work has consistently demonstrated that approximately a third of the hundreds of chemicals associated with fracking are endocrine disruptors. As a final capstone for TEDx, this summer, Earthworks enlisted our help again to develop a petition to the United Nations to enact the global ban on fracking. We also wrote a summary of health effects specific to Colorado, the original home of TEDx and a place still near and dear to our hearts. I am immensely proud of our work in this area and I'll provide links to these and other resources during the Q&A. One of the strengths that TEDx has built upon over the years is our partnerships, working directly with other NGOs and scientists. This slide lists many of our partners, and I encourage you to visit their websites for more information on what they do. I'll give you just a few examples. About two years ago, we worked with Toxic Free Future, providing written and oral testimony in Washington State on the harmful effects of PFAS, per and polyfluorinated substances. Their strong advocacy combined with our science contributed to Washington becoming the first state to restrict the use of PFAS in firefighting foam and food packaging. Most recently, we've been partnering with NRDC, Lancaster University, and UCSF to complete our new PFAS database. This will be an interactive database of 29 per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, including human, animal, and in vitro research, and data on 10 different health outcome categories. Before we close at the end of November, we plan to release a link to the database so you can follow our progress as we add chemicals. We're working to find funds to complete the database and to keep it alive at a new institution. This is going to be extremely valuable as new research comes out on the health effects of these emerging contaminants. In our oil and gas work, the NGO Physician Scientists and Engineers for Healthy Energy has always been a strong partner. They created the ROGER database, a name for Repository for Oil and Gas Energy Research. We're thrilled to report that they are currently revamping ROGER and will be building upon the framework and design of our Crack Health database. The upgrade will include new user-friendly filters and visualization tools. So you'll continue to have access to the kind of data we provided in Crack Health as well as all the additional research in Roger, which includes economic, climate, and environmental impacts. One thing I've learned in my years working at TEDx is that wise people don't have all the answers. These days you can get answers on the internet. Wise people ask the right questions. Our partnerships with scientists and NGOs and our connections to the issues and the policy challenges have helped us know what questions to ask. This has always guided our choice of research topics, and it's borne true in many of our publications having been named by journals as their most cited, most read, or most downloaded papers. In 2013, we upped the ante on our review method, adopting NIEHS's systematic review procedures for environmental health research. We not only published many papers that use systematic review methods, we also helped develop those methods by being some of the first people to apply them. A full list of our published papers is available on our website. Being a scientific nonprofit, building databases and publishing peer-reviewed papers has some unique challenges. Funding science is not as appealing as funding action. I don't know how to fully express my gratitude for the generous, dedicated, and courageous individuals who believed that science could make a difference and who believed that endocrine disruption needed urgent attention. They too should be proud of what we have accomplished. 
Our board of directors, working behind the scenes as they do, has been steadfast in their support of our work, giving us the freedom and the flexibility to pursue our mission and conduct independent science. We are immensely grateful for their wisdom and guidance. And I want to thank our science advisors, who were always just a phone call away. There are so many more names I'd love to add to this list. People who responded immediately whenever we had a question, who collaborated on projects and papers with us, and gave, our, gave us advice and took our advice. Thank you all. Later you will hear from our three speakers about their view of the future beyond TEDx. But I'd like to take a minute to share my vision of what's important. Concern over hormone disruption is growing as more and more people find out they have hormone-related health conditions. It's pretty clear that consumers don't want ADCs in their household and personal products or their air or water or food. We need to keep raising awareness and use that leverage to pressure businesses who are responsive to their customers to demand that chemical manufacturers keep these chemicals out of our homes and our lives. People also want to know, how do I avoid these chemicals? I'd like to see more research on intervention to determine what really works to reduce exposure. What behavior changes make a difference, not only to the chemical burden in our bodies, but to our health? And as for science, I think there's great value in supporting endocrine disruption as a field. In North Carolina, several colleagues and I worked together to create a community of scientists studying endocrine disruption. At each of our two annual meetings, we've had nearly 200 attendees, and that's just from the state of North Carolina. I think groups like this could be formed in other areas as well, and I would like to encourage that. Finally, I want to thank TEDx's staff. I have never felt so privileged as I have to be able to work with this team of dedicated, hardworking, brilliant women and men. TEDx is a name, it is a reputation, it is a website, but it is nothing without the people who have made it what it is known for. When I reflect on our accomplishments, one thing I wish is that we had celebrated the wins more, the big ones and the small ones. Sometimes praise is the only fuel that keeps us going when significant milestones are few and far between. We have so enjoyed reading the comments people have left on our webpage remembering TEDx. I encourage you in the audience to celebrate your work now. Be proud of what you do to make the world a better place. And on that note, I have some very good news to share. Marsha Richmond, a historian of biology whose research focuses on women in the life sciences, is currently writing a biography of Theo titled Sentinel of Science, Theo Colborn and the Discovery of Endocrine Disrupting Chemicals. This book will celebrate the life of Theo and will introduce a new generation of people to endocrine disruption. I just wanna show you one more slide that you're going to see during the Q&A that has links to all of the resources that I mentioned during my talk. And you can download the slides from the CHE website and have these links available. So thank you. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Carol. And we're going to move now to the presentations of three other people. I'm going to introduce them all now, and we'll move uh, from one to another, reserving questions and comments uh, for the uh, end of the presentations of all of them. First, the presenter is Laura Vanderberg, Associate Professor and Graduate Program Director in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences. And she'll provide the 10,000 foot view of the field of endocrine disruption, including what she sees on the horizon for the science, policy, and public awareness of this class of chemicals. She'll be followed by Janan Jensen, Founder and Executive Director of the Health and Environment Alliance, AHEAL, uh, in Europe, which will share how TEDx's scientific and communication resources and the foundation's uh, support of Theo and Carol built around ADCs has influenced and supported policies in the European Union. And uh, our last speaker will be Dr. Sarah Wiley, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Sociology and Health Science at Northeastern University. She's gonna discuss how engaged, collaborative and caring research will continue the work of TEDx through a number of activities, especially around uh, unconventional oil and gas activities. So let's go ahead now, uh, uh, Dr. Vandenberg, with your presentation. Thank you. Um, so it's a little tough to follow Carol, especially because I'm, uh, I'm remembering the work that 
uh, we've done together for the last 10 years. Um, I started working with Theo more than 10 years ago um, on stuff that I'll just briefly talk about here. And I think Carol's right that we, we should have celebrated more um, when things went well, uh, big and small. Um, and, and I think honestly um, today, uh, my talk is, is meant to do that and, and to think based on where we've been, where our successes have occurred, we can ask, um, where are we going? And sometimes it helps to step back and look at things from a different perspective. Um, I, I offer to give the 10,000 foot view here because sometimes when we do that, we can see things clearer. We can see things in a way that we can't see when we're in the middle of it. Um, and a lot of us, I think that, um, that have been working in this field, we've, we've been doing the day-to-day -day science without really thinking about what does this mean and, and where are we going. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to take this opportunity to celebrate TEDx and to celebrate the, the many, many scientists that have contributed to the TEDx mission and the broader mission focused on endocrine disruptors. So one thing that I think is a tremendous opportunity um, and, and some success and, and where we're going forward is really expanding what we think about in terms of vulnerable periods or critical periods in development um, or in life. Um, a lot of the work to date has really focused on the developing embryo, um, fetus, um, not just in humans, but in model species and in um, wildlife. And I think that as a developmental biologist, I think that's awesome. We've, we've really come to understand how important the endocrine system is for basic development of creatures uh, and how interfering with those basic developmental processes um, affect the physiology in the long term, even if um, the individual looks normal at, uh, at birth or in early life. But I think part of what we need to do and what we're starting to do is to expand to understand that uh, at other periods of life, we also have vulnerability. Um, we have very little work that has been done on um, exposures during puberty um, and in childhood. Uh, we have had a very low appreciation for how um, adult exposures um, could affect not just um, the future generations, um, either preconceptive exposures or exposures to the unborn, but also that um, the mother can be affected during pregnancy and the lactational period, that adults are affected by these chemicals, and we have very little information about how these chemicals might affect aging populations. So I think this going forward is a, a tremendous opportunity for us to sort of throw away the old dogma that um, hormones only have um, short-term effects on adults and instead to explore how disruption, even for a short period of time, can have long-lasting effects. Another area that TEDx in particular has been um, working at the forefront and, and that we're in need of more work is an appreciation of chemical mixtures. Theo's um, incredibly groundbreaking approaches um, with, with other independent scientists to focus on um, mixtures used in hydraulic fracturing or fracking is absolutely uh, an important example of how studying chemical mixtures is going to give us answers that we would not get from studying chemicals one at a time. There's a lot that we need to know about chemical mixtures. Um, we need to know uh, how important it is to, to derive the individual chemicals that are contributing to toxicity, um, how chemicals in mixtures might act additively or in competition with each other or synergistically, um, but also how chemicals in mixtures that act via different pathways but affect the same kind of outcome um, might uh, act additively or synergistically in, so, in some way. Um, so I think that the chemical mixture field has blossomed a lot in the last five years. We've had some great victories there, um, but there's a lot that needs to be done at every level of study, um, from understanding exposures to understanding effects of exposures to modeling those exposures. Another area where I think TEDx has um, been a part of the conversation is how do we improve and modernize the methods and approaches that are used to evaluate risk. Um, this is a really complicated area and, and some of the contributions that have been 
um, really groundbreaking by TEDx and academic partners are to change how we evaluate data that already exist. Um, we have huge amounts of data for some chemicals, and yet those data are not being used in the regulatory process. Um, and part of that is needing to know how do we evaluate reproducibility? How do we evaluate validity of outcomes? Um, and, and TEDx and their approaches to um, conducting systematic reviews and scoping reviews has provided really great steps forward for our field. We also, <clears throat> I'm sure everyone on this call has seen a figure that looks like this. Um, this is sort of the approach that we think about um, for risk assessment. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for growth um, and, and areas where TEDx and, and affiliated scientists have participated in asking questions. Um, we need to know um, whether the outcomes that are being evaluated during hazard ID, are they good for evaluating health outcomes? I think we've been we've gotten really good at evaluating toxicity. We we know what kills and we know how things kill, um, but we're not still very good at identifying outcomes that are relevant to human diseases. Um, this is something a lot of us have a lot of passionate about. It's it's work that academic partners are working um, to uh, develop the right outcomes relevant to diseases, specifically endocrine diseases. But we have a ways to go there. There's a big movement to move away from animal testing, to using um, in vitro screening, to using molecular modeling approaches, um, to using high throughput screens um, with perhaps non-vertebrate animals. Um, but we need to develop approaches to actually using those data during risk assessment. Um, those data exist. A lot of these assays exist, and we just we haven't convinced the right people for how to use them when we're um, making decisions about chemical safety. With exposure assessment, I, I think this is an area where um, the technology has really caught up to the questions that we wanna ask so that we can, we can fundamentally look at what people are exposed to. But there are still major data gaps. Chemicals that we expected to be used in one place are being used in dozens of places. Um, we're learning a lot more about metabolism of chemicals and how route of exposure affects those uh, metabolic processes. Um, but we don't know how to look for what we don't even know is there. Um, so there's a lot of area for growth um, in the exposure assessment field. Um, I've already seen uh, pop up in the chat box a question about how do we deal with low dose effects, effects that are seen um, only when we study low doses, and also how do we deal with nonlinear or non-monotonic dose responses? Um, we know that these things exist. It's, it's silly to pretend that they're not real, um, but uh, we need to impress upon regulatory agencies that they need to be utilized, and we need methods for how to do that. In the risk assessment arena, um, Again, we need to study chemicals as mixtures since that's actually how people or wildlife are exposed. We need to think about mixtures not just as chemical mixtures, but as mixtures of stressors, especially when we consider changes to our climate that's going to affect um, other stressor responses. Um, we also need to think about those mixtures in terms of chemicals that act in very different ways, but um, affect the same kinds of outcomes. Um, and uh, we do also need to um, continue to build on the approaches developed by um, scientists at TEDx and um, academic partners to evaluate reliability and reprodu reproducibility of studies so that we aren't just using industry-oriented studies for risk assessment. We can also utilize this vast knowledge of data that comes from academic laboratories. Last but not least, I think our biggest concern is how do we stop playing chemical whack-a-mole? Um, we, we've been doing this with regrettable replacements um, in my field, studying bisphenol A and then bisphenol S and then other bisphenols. Um, this, is, this is sort of a, a frustrating and, um, and in the end, it's going to, to lead to very little progress if we continue to do things according to the status quo. So I think all of us are hoping to reduce exposures to EDCs and also to develop methods so that we can avoid regrettable replacements without needing to study them in the depth that we have studied 
sort of the original chemical that has raised concern. So at, with that, um, I'm gonna finish my talk and express again my extreme gratitude to Carol, uh, to Theo, and to the rest of our friends, colleagues, um, and, uh, and future partners um, as they are leaving TEDx. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Laura. We're gonna move on now to Jinan's presentation. I'm gonna share that in just a moment here, and Jinan's gonna jump on on the phone with us. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just make your slide big so everybody can see it. Okay, thank you, Hannah. And uh, it's really great to be here uh, today on this Beyond TEDx call. Um, and I'm very honored um, to be asked to give a bit of um, storytelling uh, about how uh, groups in Europe uh, have used and appreciated and really are grateful for TEDx's resources and, and work that we've had with uh, Carol and Theo over the years, and then talk a little bit about what is happening on EDCs in Europe. So you can move to the next slide. First thing, I just wanted to give you a bit of information about who the Health and Environment Alliance is. We're one of the leading not-for-profit organizations. Uh, we address how the environment affects human health in the European Union and beyond. And we work to shape laws and policies um, that not only promote planetary but human health and protect those most affected by pollution. And as the slide shows, we have uh, over 80 member organizations and it really is an alliance um, from both international, European, national and local groups. As you see, of doctors associations, patient groups, women's groups, um, not-for-profit health insurers and, and environmental groups. And we're all um, working together for better health through environment, uh, environmental work. So the next slide, please. So today I wanted to start uh, with a little celebration of um, over a decade of friendship between TEDx and HEAL. Um, and I chose uh, these pictures to represent um, one of the very first times um, where uh, TEDx came over um, to Brussels. And here we see Carol uh, at our annual General Assembly. And what was really exciting, um, although I first learned about uh, Theo when I read Our Stolen Future, like many of you probably on this call have um, from her and Pete, uh, it, it was um, at this meeting here in Brussels where uh, we were able to invite TEDx as a high-level speaker uh, to talk about endocrine disruption and the science behind it, and um, it was and share all of their resources. And I can say for us, it was a very big turning point because a lot of our members, particularly from the health side, who hadn't really understood uh, EDCs, um, uh, were really excited, and I think it helped us uh, as an organization ensure that EDCs uh, remained and actually enlarged our, our, the members who are working and excited uh, to contribute to this work. Um, so that was uh, one thank you for uh, Carol for coming to this AGA, and this was already seven years ago. So uh, then the next slide, please. This slide gives you just a little bit about um, what our work at HEAL is around um, and our vision around a, a non-toxic environment. Um, and um, we're very much working uh, within the European Union to improve and ensure a regulation um, protects not only today's but future children um, from health harming chemicals. And Europe does have an obligation to protect its people and environment um, caused by endocrine disrupting chemicals. And at the moment, what we are going to talk a bit more about, but although we have moved, I would say, a lot on raising awareness, um, we had the first EDC strategy in 1999, we still, in the laws, are, are very... Um, sporadic and not at all, um, they're very patchy. So they're not really being implemented and there's a lot of gaps where EDCs aren't regulated at all. Um, 
And here in this uh, briefing, which is available in a few languages, we actually uh, set out some of the principles for this health protective strategy. Uh, and the next slide, basically, what I'd like to show is how TEDx's scientific and communication resources on EDCs have really been a huge inspiration and influence for not only us at HEAL, but others working towards that goal. Um, here's two, the specific example I would like to mention right now, which I think Carol mentioned at the beginning, is the TEDx list of lists, a list of EDCs. And for us, this has been really such a key tool that we've used again and again be as a reference not only on publications, um, also on reports, press releases, but also as a reference tool to point regulators, policymakers, or journalists who want to answer the question is how many EDCs are out there? And again, this has just been a, a really, um, I can't even begin. I was going to try and tell you how many times we've cited it, but it was, uh, it was a bit too much, so I, I didn't come up with an exact number. But again, this is something that really has helped build a, our base um, and raise awareness, educate people to understand um, all of the different EDCs, uh, the chemicals that are potential EDCs out there. The next example, next slide please, so it's slide six. Um, here um, is a slide where actually just uh, last year in 2018, we teamed up with Carol at, at TEDx and worked with the Science Communication Network and a board of international scientists to really look at how we could reduce complex scientific concepts surrounding EDCs into simple, accurate, and compelling illustrations. And these infographics that you see here, low doses matter, understanding potency, and modern science matters, um, really have been a huge hit, not only on social media, but also in, as a really a calling card when we're meeting people um, to talk uh, in a very simple way about where is everyday exposure coming from, what type of health effects are associated with it, and that first one where you see um, the low doses matter. It's amazing when you give someone this, they really start looking and it's like, ah, oh, I had no idea that there were so many different disease and health conditions implicated. And people really also are uh, very mm, excited to, to learn more. And what was really nice for us at HEAL and working with TEDx is to know that this is underpinned by uh, scientific studies for each one of these health conditions. And very exciting is not, this is not only going out in English, but we have with the help of partners and scientists translated them into lots of other languages. And again, this is really going back to what I've heard at the beginning is, you know, everybody needs to know about EDCs and we want everybody in every language to know about EDCs. And these, this, this, these, apps, these tools are really helping us to do that and will continue to do so. Next slide, please. Uh, another way in which uh, I would say uh, we've been really excited and, and very happy and is to have the fantastic transatlantic uh, collaboration with TEDx within our work for EDC Free Europe coalition. And the EDC Free Europe is, is a coalition of public interest groups who represent more than 70 environmental health, women, and consumer groups. And we're all sharing a concern about EDCs and their impact on our health and wildlife and looking for policy opportunities to address that. Um, this, uh, one of the, uh, our vision for EDCs uh, is brought together in these eight demands um, that we uh, shared not that long ago, just uh, at the beginning of May 2018. And here again, we drew upon a TEDx list of lists to highlight some of the different lists. Um, and at that time, the list said that there was over 1,400 potential EDCs. Um, I would say I'd like to say on behalf of the EDC Free Secretariat, we also thanked Carol in, in a call uh, earlier. And um, I'd like to say once again that you know your work and your team's work as a campaign partner for, your, for the EDC Free Europe has time and time really been a useful 
science-based science -based and technical um, over the years. So thank you, FedEx, for being a campaign partner. Next slide, please. So now how can we take these um, the solid inspirational work that we're, uh, I've been talking about uh, that have been laid down by TEDx, um, especially here in Europe, to the future. And um, I'd just like to leave you with some inspirational quotes because um, my time is up very soon. Um, and here is a, I think I'm on the one that says the future of EDCs in Europe. I hope I got to that one. Uh, um, Hannah, I hope that's where I am right now. Um, and here is um, just a slide where we actually wanted to share with you what's happening in the European Union. We think there are some exciting promises ahead to move forward on EDCs. Why am I so optimistic? Well, you may have heard that there's a new European Parliament that was elected in May. And we now have a new European Commission. President and commissioners are now being appointed and they're set to take office for a five-year period in December of this year. And here on this slide, we really show some of the very first um, political messages and quotes from the commission president, who is a medical doctor uh, herself, Ursula von der Leyen. And um, it is amazing to me to come and read and hear um, someone talk about that actually she's going to put forward a cross-cutting strategy to protect citizens' health from environmental degradation and pollution, addressing not only water and air quality, hazardous chemicals, industrial emissions, pesticides, and endocrine disruptors. And so I think that is really exciting, um, and it's something we will have to watch very carefully, that um, fine words turn into concrete actions. And then the next slide, it's the last slide, uh, almost next to the slide, um, is just, again, some commitments that were heard just a few weeks ago from the Health Commissioner and the Environment Commissioner for the European Union, again, about their uh, commitments toward um, EDCs. And then the last slide, which is just, again, I would like to um, finish by going back to the beginning. And here is uh, one of the first times uh, that we met Theo, where we hosted with the WWF, I believe at the time, an event, this was 2008, on endocrine disruptors. And again, um, she was very important to uh, highlighting the problem, which wasn't being talked about as much. And another really useful tool was the CV, uh, C, CVD. Um, on the male predicament and EDCs, which was quite a hit when we handed it out in Brussels and other places in Europe. So thank you very much, TEDx. Thank you, Carol, and your team. And thank you, especially Theo. Thank you so much, Janan. We're going to be moving on now to our next presenter, Sarah. Sarah Wiley, she's getting her slides ready. Sorry, I just realized I was also muted. <laughs> um, I am really honored to uh, be able to join this chorus of thank you for the Endocrine Disruption Exchange and particularly Theo, who've uh, played such a pivotal role in in my work. Um, you know, I arrived um, into Paonia in the winter of 2006 into this small rural uh, Colorado town um, and first did an internship with Theo that has ended up producing, um, you know, uh, my book, Fractivism, Corporate Bodies and Chemical Bonds, which describes the work of TEDx um, building the first um, database of chemicals used in fracking and their health effects a project that I was uh, really lucky to be able to collaborate um, in, in beginning to build. Um, and the first summary of that database was released in 2006. And I've been really uh, loving how frequently TEDx's work building archives and doing public communications work have come up in the um, talk so far. And this talk builds on that. I'm going to describe a little bit about the outcomes of that database um, and then 
reflect on the current moment and provide a really um, concrete uh, idea for one uh, next step that I think uh, might be a really great collaborative project. Um, so returning to this first publication of the chemicals used in natural gas development and their health effects, uh, TEDx shared this um, as a project that was designed to provide a glimpse of the patterns of possible health hazards for those living in proximity to gas development. And this fell to um, the hands of a, a small, uh, some would say, under-resourced uh, non-profit to build this database because of the uh, exemptions of fracking from the Safe Drinking Water Act in 2005. And as I outline in my book, the many strategies that this industry uses to become unarchivable um, that makes it very hard to tell a coherent story about its impacts. And TEDx really began providing um, one of the first kind of coherent stories um, about the overall uh, potential impacts of um, practicing hydraulic fracking at scale. Um, so this is one of the figures from their 2011 version um, of the um, summary of fracking chemicals. Um, and what they showed in this, uh, what they did was organize these chemicals um, by their potential health effects um, and show large scale patterns. So for instance, of the volatile chemicals, those that evaporate in air, over 90% of them were skin sense organ toxicants by TEDx's reckoning. Um, and, and then very concerning, uh, brain and nervous system toxicants are also very high um, in the uh, volatile chemicals. And looking over at endocrine disruptors, um, as Carol mentioned early on, um, they predicted here that about 40% of them um, were um, endocrine disruptors. Uh, and so this, sorry, for some reason my screen's so advancing. Um, so this way of presenting um, the chemicals used in fracking at, uh, on a spectrum as a whole, uh, potentially impacting a wide range of health systems, um, was really transformational to public debate around uh, this health and safety of this practice, which had largely been um, not investigated uh, after the EPA's initial report in 2004. And so TEDx was vital and bringing legislative attention, the first congressional hearing with, from Waxman, Markey and DeGette um, on the health effects of fracking. Uh, they inspired Gasland, uh, which really carried uh, uh, you know, a, a broad message of concern um, from communities and featured Theo prominently. Um, and they also enabled EPA to begin its first investigations um, into the chemicals used uh, in this practice following um, that exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act. And they've also now produced a booming field of research uh, in the environmental health impacts of fracking, such that we now have, and this is from um, TEDx's current database of studies on health effects and fracking. We now have six epidemiological studies uh, demonstrating that people who live with close proximity to oil and gas wells have an increased risk of childhood leukemia, uh, asthma attacks, congenital heart defects, birth weight uh, and uh, low birth weight and preterm birth compared with people who live with no production nearby. And this ought to be really concerning to the 17.6 million Americans who now live within a mile of oil and gas wells. So despite the rise of um, concern about the public health impacts of this practice, uh, this has spread um, to 33 states and beyond. And um, as President Trump uh, loudly says, uh, a golden era of American energy uh, is now underway thanks to the um, use of hydraulic fracking to extract both natural gas and oil. So fracking uh, was sold as a bridge to um, a low carbon future um, because it was supposed to increase the supply of natural gas. And what was often not reflected on uh, is that hydraulic fracking is also equally useful in extracting oil, such that now in 2018, the US is leading globally both natural gas and um, crude oil production. Um, and this is only set to increase. Um, oil executives uh, in Houston uh, are describing what's coming as a tsunami or and perhaps awfully as uh, this coming flood of oil uh, as being of biblical proportions. And that's because of the massive investments that are going ahead in building pipelines um, to increase the flow of oil uh, from the Permian Basin uh, to the Gulf Coast, um, oil and natural gas for export. 
And of course, one of the things that's often overlooked as we discuss fracking um, is that nat natural gas also goes to feed the massive production of petrochemicals because 70% of the cost of producing ethylene, which is one of the uh, base components of many plastics, um, comes from natural gas. So the reduced cost of natural gas is spurring a massive investment in chemical production nationally. Um, and so there are five steam crackers set to begin operation by the end of 2019 along the Gulf Coast. Um, and when we look at who is producing um, ethylene from those cracking operations, um, we see the oil majors appearing. Um, so what Theo was trying to push people towards to the end, towards the end of her oil and gas work was really thinking about how to connect endocrine disruptors and climate change through the lens um, of hydraulic fracking, which demands many petrochemicals and is also producing uh, many more petrochemicals, many of which are endocrine disruptors. So while we are um, doubling down on uh, oil and gas extraction um, nationally in terms of infrastructure building and production capacity, we are also at a pivotal moment where we have two of the leading democratic candidates uh, for president uh, saying they support a ban of fracking, uh, where we're seeing uh, international um, climate strikes and real proposals for a Green New Deal. Um, so what could, we be, what could be done now building on the spirit of TEDx's archiving work? Um, so when TEDx first released its database, it called for two things, um, full disclosure of chemicals used in fracking and monitoring. And what we have ended up with um, is a disclosure um, that has been described as, as opaque transparency through the website supported by industry, Frac Focus, um, which uh, has, is notorious uh, for uh, being very hard to search, uh, very hard to, um, organized data from and very hard to analyze. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, they don't really describe, they describe that chemicals are used in fracking but don't provide any information on the health effects uh, of those chemicals which might be really important to you as a landowner. Um, and if you're going to look for a well near you, you need an enormous amount of information to be able to um, find out about it. Uh, you need to know the CAS number, the chemical abstract services number for the particular chemical you're looking for, for instance, the API number for the well, um, the well name, uh, the range start date, uh, a lot of information that's very hard for the everyday uh, person um, to actually gather to even find information um, about a well. So how can we make this database more useful? Um, I've been chatting with a researcher called Gary Allison, and he has just published online, um, you guys can all check it out here, on Code Ocean, a cleaned up version of the FRAC Focus database, where he's trying to demonstrate methods to transform this, uh, you know, opaque transparency vehicle um, into a usable research database. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a bit of uh, data from that database um, and just give you some examples of what's been filtered out first. So in making the database useful, he's filtered out um, events where they're listed, but there isn't actually any data um, in the event. And that's the orange ones that have been filtered out there. So the data you're seeing is from about 2013 onwards. Um, he's removed duplicate events. He's also removed any event where water is not the main carrier in the fracking. Of, in, in fracking. Diesel um, is also frequently used as a carrier uh, in fracking, and he's removed those events. He's also removed uh, information about um, proprietary uh, chemicals because there isn't any uh, useful information you can gather from them. So building on that, I want to just quickly look at one chemical that um, started out the uh, TEDx's work on the endocrine disruption uh, uh, and fracking fracking chemical database, um, 2-butoxyethanol. This is a chemical that Laura Amos, who Carol mentioned in the beginning, um, was potentially exposed to and developed a rare form of adrenal tumor. Um, and she connected with TEDx through reading um, a, a memo that Theo had written about the potential for this chemical to cause adrenal tumors. Um, so 2BE has been used in 20,000 or more fracking events since 2013 and in one operation alone it was used in half a million pounds. Um, and if we look at the total amount of 2BE that's been used nationally, it's about 50 million pounds. Uh, just to give you some sense of how much that actually is, that's about 1.5 times the weight of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, so this isn't regulated um, as a water 
water contaminant. There is no kind of regulatory thresholds about how much there can be in drinking water uh, because there hasn't been any belief that it would get into drinking water uh, in these kinds of quantities. But it is regulated um, in the air uh, between five parts per million and 20 parts per million. Um, and if we were to try and dilute that much um, physical 2BE in, uh, in water to five parts per million per se, it would be about as much water as Lake Ontario. So looking at the total weight of EDCs uh, used in fracking events, if you cross list the um, TEDx uh, identified EDCs used in fracking and um, Gary Allison's cleaned up version of the frac focus database, um, you found that about 1.7 billion pounds of EDCs have been used in fracking um, uh, so far up to March 2019. And that's about four times the weight of the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower in Chicago, North America's second largest building. Um, so there is a really pressing need uh, to investigate this industry at scale um, and to make the resources that we do have available to us meaningful to the public. Um, so my final kind of proposal uh, is to organize a collaborative, rapid and interdisciplinary analysis um, of this database that's focused on producing a special issue or op-eds and really working towards a consensus statement uh, around fracking um, in the spirit of the con wing spread consensus statement statement that was so important around um, endocrine disruptors that um, is trying to think about how to bring um, an analysis to the public of the scale uh, of the health risks associated uh, with this practice. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry for going a little over time. Oh, thank you very much, everyone, for, for these excellent presentations. And I think we're really getting a sense, uh, if we hadn't already, of the enormity of the issues surrounding EDCs and the incredible work uh, TEDx has done to move these forward. I think Theo would have been incredibly proud of, of TEDx and the way Carol and her staff have elevated the issues and really taken uh, on so many activities that need to be continued on in many other ways. I, I'm hoping that uh, we can talk a little bit more about uh, how these things, uh, how we could possibly collaborate, many of us on the call with the members of uh, the TEDx staff and uh, the endeavors that specifically Carol talked about and, and, and all, as well as Janan and Healed to keep the work going. We're gonna open up now to a brief section for questions and comments uh, that Carol and I are going to co-share. We do have a uh, question here from Jamie Page uh, and I think it uh, uh, could be answered by both Carol and Laura about uh, the, the need to uh, address the issue that EDCs are acting at levels that are below the reference dose in many places. And so uh, findings about the levels of EDCs in people's bodies or in the ecosystems otherwise and, and wildlife and so on is easily dismissed because they are below safety standards. How can we move forward to move this issue uh, so that, that the safety standards no longer holds that EDCs can be taken on more realistically so very harmful to human health. So uh, Carol or uh, uh, Laura, if you want to address this. So I think it's a great question. It, this is more of a how do we communicate the science question? Um, because if we're finding effects that are occurring below what's considered some safe dose, however you want to define that, then that means the safe dose is wrong. And, and that's what we need to impress upon regulators that in historically, when we look at safe doses, they move to the left um, with time, with knowledge, that we're, we're usually not as conservative as we should be. And with knowledge, we need to provide more caution and protection for populations. So the unfortunate thing is that uh, demonstrating an exposure is not enough to be convincing. You have to demonstrate harmful effects, which means that a risk assessment failure has already occurred. Um, and I think that that's, that's really unfortunate, that, but this is an issue of educating people about what that means. Um, I also think that uh, the, the slide that I, I built that showed where in the risk assessment um, process we need to um, improve, part of that comes from improving the inputs that go into risk assessment. So if we're only looking at what doses maim and kill, but not the doses that affect pituitary function, breast function, um, we're missing a big part of the picture here. And, and that's where academic partners need to be playing a role to continue to push 
for better evaluations of hazards, that we're not just talking about what kills, we're talking about what affects health over the long term. Excellent. Carol, do you want to make any comments on this? No, I think that was a great answer. Laura is the expert on this, and I'll, I would just second what she said. Indeed. Sarah, I see you not, You were nodding your head. Is there any, any comments that you want to add? Oh, just agreement. I mean, the, the safe threshold has to be the, uh, the place where there isn't any observable dose. Uh, and the whole concept of thinking with thresholds is part of really trying to figure out how much of something hazardous you can put into the world um, that I, I think is a really flawed mindset. And in general, we need to re, uh, be redesigning our chemicals not to produce any such hazards rather than trying to make things livable. Um, because it always falls to those with least social power um, uh, to live with those conditions. Um, you know, and saying that something is safe in its usage dose doesn't mean it's safe to produce, doesn't mean it's safe to live next to that factory. Um, and frequently these chemicals are downstream of very unsafe extractive industries that produce all sorts of other social harms. So I think we really have to um, be reframing this question about safe dose again and again to think about it, what kind of infrastructure does this dose produce? Very good answers. Uh, Carol, do you have any, do you see any hands raised if anybody want to make a comment? So I think we didn't really clarify. We have a lot of people commenting in the chat. And I think that's great if you want to make a comment. If you actually have a question for a panelist, could you put it in the Q&A box, which is another option on your screen? Um, hovering over your screen will allow you to do that. Um, and then, uh, Hannah, you, you may have to jump in here because for people to actually verbally ask a question, they need to raise their hand so that I can call on them and unmute them. And we're going to start out with um, a comment from the chair of the TEDx Board of Directors, Elise Miller. Um, but then we'll um, open it up so other people can also verbally ask questions. But I need Hannah to remind people how to raise their hand because I'm not sure how it looks on the listener yes. screen. So if you hover over your name, there'll be a drop down box that can that'll appear. And then you click on the raise hand feature. Um, and then you'll be able to see a hand pop up. There'll be a hand that Carol will see and she'll be able to call on you. And I saw Sarah, uh, one of our, Sarah Howard, actually just raised her hand. So it's working. Um, so feel free to hover over your name and look for that raise hand feature. Okay, so we'll get to Sarah after, we're going back and forth between the Q&A and the hand raising, but let's give Elise a chance to um, speak at this point. And Elise, I think you can unmute yourself. As a panelist. I'm unmuted. Do you, can you hear me? Yep. Great. I can hear you. Well, I feel this is a little out of order, but there, and there's so much I could say, but I'll just make two brief points. Um, first, to serve on the board for 11 years and as board chair the last few years has been an exceptional honor and privilege for me. It's rare in this life to get to work with those who are not only brilliant and dedicated, but wise and heartfelt as well. And TEDx's staff and board have truly exhibited all these traits in spades. And second, though every organization and institution has its particular arc of life, success cannot be measured by the length of existence, but by the quality and sustainability of its accomplishments. TEDx's groundbreaking achievements in its 16 years, as uh, described so beautifully by our speakers, will live on through all of us as a credit to Theo's tenacious vision and Carol's collaborative leadership, as well as a promise to future generations. This is a poignant time. I, for one, am keeping my Kleenex box close. <laughs> um, and I offer just a deep bow of gratitude for all those who have made this work possible and all who will continue to keep TEDx's legacy alive in new forms. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Elise. That was beautiful. Thank you. So I think Cheryl will ask our next question from the Q&A. question. Someone is asking, uh, does anybody have any information or anecdotes about Theo that you'd like to share? Is there anything, Carol, that you'd like to just say to bring forward the kind of persona of uh, Theo? So, so I will say that the person who asked that is Marcia Richmond. She's the one who's writing the biography and she has included her email address in both the chat and the Q&A. So anybody who would like to share a story about Theo and possibly have it printed in a biography, 
to um, write down that email address so that you can get a hold of Marcia and share that with her. I believe that's what she's asking for. Um, and maybe we can use the couple minutes we have here to get um, some other questions answered. Okay, are there any hands raised, uh, Carol? No, you? I'm not seeing the hand raising function, but I did, uh, I think I allowed Sarah to talk. So Sarah Howard, are you able to, can we hear you? Hi, yeah, I didn't actually have a question. I was just um, clicking around by accident. I clicked on raise my hand. But I would like to say if anyone, my email is there. I do send out a weekly um, list of late, of scientific studies on EDC. So please feel free to email me if you'd like to get that list. Or I send it to Che Science, which is a listserv that Che has, which is the bottom link there. Anyway. And it's a wonderful list. I, I encourage everyone, it's one email a week and it has tons of studies that come out every week on endocrine disruption. So please get on Sarah's list. Okay. Back to you, Charles. All right, okay, so uh, there, there's a, a couple of questions here, but I do wanna leave uh, time. Jane Monk has sent us a video to show as well. And so I'm gonna just uh, do a couple of short questions here and then let's go to the video because we are running out of time for this uh, webinar. Uh, one question has to do with, um, uh, this is to address to all panelists. I'm not sure who's the most appropriate person. I'm not familiar with the, 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 the assay. Uh, mentioned, are there any applications of atom trap trace technology for tracking EDCs through aquifers? Is this something even here's uh, familiar with? Laura, do you know anything about this? Or Sarah? Okay, so this is from Ted Lapis. So you, Ted, you might wanna email in a further question and we'll see if we can't find some information for you. All right, then there's a question from, uh, are all the, all the presentations gonna be available on the TEDx website? Yes, they are, and a lot of comments saying this has been a great webinar and many thanks to everyone for their presentations and the synopsis, especially of where we are going with EDCs. So unless there are other questions, I think we should go ahead, Hannah, and show Jane's uh, video. Sure, we actually do have a couple of raised hands too. Oh, so um, do you wanna get to this first since they're on live? Sure, let's yeah. do that. Sure, let's take these two. Um, how about Ninja Reineke, can, you, um, can we hear you? I just unmuted you. Not hearing you, Ninja. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Perfect. Hi. Well, I just quickly wanted to grab the opportunity and say, thank TEDx one more time, in addition to Janon, how much you have done for our work in Europe. And you, we could go as, as far as saying it's all thanks to Theo coming to Brussels and convincing the European Parliament about the importance of endocrine disruptors in the first place, which started a whole of the regulatory processes um, that we've seen in Europe over the last 10 years. And you, all the team from TEDx, uh, you are just such a great asset and reliable support in our work. So we are very sad. Uh, we will miss you. We will try to continue the work, but we also look to the whole uh, team of other people uh, um, also on this call to continue our collaboration across the Atlantic. And from ChemTrust, uh, on behalf of ChemTrust, and also Elizabeth Salter Green, uh, who's on the call, who we still remember Theo from our work at WWF, we want to say we'll never forget Theo, we'll never forget TEDx, and we have the ChemTrust pledge that we will continue your work. Thank you. Thank you, Ninja. Hannah, did you want to have one more uh, person respond or were you going to show the video now? Um, I can show the video now unless there is there someone else with a raised hand. There's one more with a raised hand. Ted Lapis, how about we, we do that, that and then uh, we'll do the video. Sounds good. I think you're unmuted now. Uh, Hello? Yes, we can hear you. So I wanted to know if there was some research going on about flow outside of uh, the casing. It seems that, especially in the United States, we focus a, a good well is one where the casing maintains its integrity by being able to hold pressure. 
but uh, the flow outside uh, of the casing is, uh, I think, where some of the real problems are w with fracking. Uh, uh, well, w with the uh, with production. Uh, Sarah, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it's a good point that you raise and it's uh, frequently what's argued is that um, the trouble is not like the, the, the fracking zone that you're trying to frack is so far separated from um, water uh, by depth that the, the real problem with water contamination is coming from casing breaking down the cement um, that's sort of the, the beginning of, of the well and getting um, uh, holes and breaks in, in that casing. Um, and I don't know of any um, body working on sort of systematically analyzing that right now. Um, but it's it's one of the um, current theories as to why you end up you do end up with water contamination in some cases. Um, and it's, EPA actually wrote about this way back in the. Um, 80s, uh, the Environmental Working Group t turned up an old EPA study years ago, um, and uh, I can I can look it up too. Uh, but it's uh, you know I think it's it's interesting to look at ways to sort of make this practice safer. Um, but again, I think you have to look at the big picture of the the whole practice um, and that's the demand of, for the chemical production it's the cleaning of the water um, down the line um, it's the air emissions um, for the the whole thing so I'm a little dubious of this uh, kind of uh, an engineered approach to make um, the practice down hole um, safer and safer um, when it's uh, you know it's the system that's producing insecurity um, and health risk all the way along that was a great answer. Yes. Um, so now we have this surprise video. Let's, yes. I'm excited. Let's, to Let's take a look at it, Hannah. All right, here you are. Thank you, Carol and team, for providing all this great information on endocrine disruptors. The time has come to say goodbye, but your work has been so incredibly helpful and useful, and I'm sure it will continue to be. So. I wish you all the best of luck and take care and thank you for everything that you've done. That was very nice, Jane. Thank you. I'm not sure if people were able to see the video, um, but that was a, a little great piece of technology there, I guess, that you can send in a video recording of your, your wishes. Um, and I appreciate it very much. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. Charles, would you agree? I think it is time to wrap up. And thank you very much to all our presenters who gave excellent comp, uh, presentations. And these will, of course, be on the TEDx and the Collaborative and Health and Environment. Sides. Okay. And thank you so much, TEDx. Thank you, everyone. This has been wonderful. I appreciate our speakers and the audience and, and everyone and we'll try to respond to any questions that still are unanswered and we can get back to people individually we'll be around for another month stay tuned and 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 please let's all find ways to stay in touch with each other and especially with all of you at tex because we know you're going to go on to future endeavors that are going to be incredibly important and successful and we want to hear about them so please stay in touch thanks everybody thank, thank you. you so we are approaching the end of our webinar today a video recording of this webinar will be available on the CHE website soon. Tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the recording. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Carol, Laura, Janan, and Sarah for taking the time to talk with us today, and to you, Charles, for your excellent moderation. If others would like to express your gratitude to TEDx, who did, who did not have a chance today, you can go to endocrinedisruption.org and click on About Us and go to Remembering TEDx. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Carol, and your team. We appreciate everything you've done and contributed. And have a great day. <laughs>